Before we start this time of prayer, I would like to to take time to introduce this uh, time of uh, prayer together as a small uh, meditation amongst all of us. Um, in the Feast of St. Joseph, it's obvious that the topic of our meditation, our conversation with our Lord, should be uh, this figure that uh, introduced in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ was so uh, important to take care of Mary and Jesus during the childhood of our Lord. Mm, I wanted to, to read for you and to comment because it has to do a lot with the theology of the body, uh, all the um, Mm, the concerns and the, the ideas that uh, Pope Francis bring up in this letter that he wrote about St. Joseph recently. It's called Patris Corde, which means the, the heart of a father. And he goes through different uh, topics in this letter. Many of them are very, very interesting. Like, for example, at the beginning, the first number is love father, a father who is loved by his children, a father with tenderness, a father in obedience, a father in being welcoming to others, a father with a creative daringness. And uh, this one that I wanted to comment uh, um, uh, slowly and going deeper into what it says of this, a father in the shadows. It takes the title from a book uh, written years ago by a Polish uh, writer called Jan Dobrasinski. And uh, he tells us the story of St. Joseph um, in life in the, in, the, in the form of a novel. I remember reading it and uh, it was very moving to see how um, uh, he will recreate and uh, perhaps invent also some um, scenes of the life of, uh, of Mary and, and Joseph and how they met each other and uh, what will they talk about and how they will go about the, the business of daily life. And for me there were two things that were very moving. For, for, perhaps um, the first one that was when, uh, when Joseph meets Our Lady for the first time. It was really great. I mean, I don't know. I don't want to be a spoiler, but uh, uh, that's a book that is worth uh, reading. It. But it says here that uh, uh, that Saint Joseph appears in this novel, and it's true. It was like the earthly shadow of the heavenly Father, and I think this is a very first idea, very interesting that the Holy Father brings up, and um, uh, it has to do a lot with the theology of the body. We have said that. The body, and the body alone, reflects part of the mysteries hidden in God. That is, that we learn things about the invisible God through the visible body. In this case, of course, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, in order to, to understand this a little bit better, I will, I will tell you some, a small anecdote that I heard that was very enlightening for me. Um, there were some people talking with a seer of one of these uh, places where there were uh, apparitions of Our Lady, and uh, somebody said, Is it, "Isn't it curious that in the apparition, in the places where there are apparitions of Our Lady, you always find that people say there is the smell of two roses, I mean, roses smell?" And one of these uh, it was a child, I think, or, or a young lady that. She uh, commented to that and says, well, I mean, I think you are getting it wrong. No, it's, it's not that when Our Lady appears that it smells roses. It's that roses smell like Our Lady. That's a, that's a very nice one. I mean, it's trying to tell us that sometimes the, the human reality, what they do is a, is a kind of a shadow or is a kind of an image of heavenly realities. 
But that's actually what we do with Theology of the Body because it's a very incarnational theology. That is that what I study is how God has decided in order to reveal himself to become a man like us. So that being able to be seen, to be heard, to be touched, to be smelled, to when, when you do all those things, your senses, you are able to enter through your senses. I like that very much. I, remember, you rem, I hope you remember that beautiful song of John Denver. You fill up my senses. That, that's, that's really Catholic. Actually, actually it's so beautiful that, that God has wanted us to, to learn about his mysteries through uh, these senses, which is something so material, so human, I would say so unholy, but that's what God wants, that we learn that He's able to come down to us. That's what the Incarnation is all about. That the Incarnation, in a way, is the beginning of uh, the work of redemption. But he continues saying here and says, In his relationship to Jesus, Joseph was the earthly shadow of the Heavenly Father. He watched over him and protected him, never leaving him to go on his own way. We can think this of Moses. Here now it brings a parallelism of the Old Testament on how Moses took care of the people of God, how God took care of his people in the desert during 40 years until they entered into the Promised Land. And he says and quotes uh, in the book of Deuteronomy in the first chapter, verse 31, and he says, In the wilderness you saw the Lord your God carried you just as one carries a child all the way that you travel. This is a, this image of, of a, a trip, and in the trip how very often a father has to take his child and take him all the way until he finish the, the trip. Fathers, continues Pope Francis, are not born but made. And uh, this is also very incarnational and also can, we can relate that. That is, even a saint, that's what we are all called to, they're not, they're not born, they, they have to be made. Because we have freedom, and with our freedom, we choose what we want. And that's why I feel that it's very interesting that we uh, could that, think about, about that, and how you also, as a person, whatever you, whatever you are, and uh, I will say that the, 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 the image of the Blessed Trinity always is talking about three relations that are very, very, very important and that I think are very interesting to look at them because uh, they, 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 in a way, uh, remind us how the theology, of, the theology of the body just fits so well. And is that God teaches us that He is Father and He wants us to relate to Him like that our Father, who art in heaven. I, I, I saw to, uh, recently here in Spain there is a campaign in order to prepare for the Feast of St. Joseph that has become like um, it's Father's Day. And uh, it was very interesting, very beautiful to see to say, we love you, fathers. And then he says, especially there is, a, there is an arrow that goes down and you realize that what is written down there is Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And the, the whole Our Father is, 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 is written in that, in that message. I found it very, very, uh, very seducive, I mean, very interesting. So, how to relate the Father here on earth to the, the Heavenly Father? Well, that's, that's a relation, a human relation, the, we all have the experience of having a father. Some people don't have that experience and in fact I think it's something that we all miss when we don't have. No, we don't have it. And then I wanted to go to the next. You have a father, have father have children and therefore there is a beautiful relationship between the father to the son and the son to the father. But the sons also bring up another relation, very, very interesting relation, and is what we call fraternity, or brotherhood, or fellowship. That is that we have to deal with one another, and that that um, relation is also in God. Because 
God does, does not want to have only one son. He has a one natural son, but he wants to have many adopted sons. And that's what we become when we are baptized. Baptism gives us a share in God's nature and therefore we start living God's life in us. A life that will reach to its fullness the moment that we die and we enter. You, you can see all the relations that you get with that because you are therefore when you are baptized a child of God and therefore you become a brother of Jesus Christ and then you become a son of Mary because Mary is also involved in this beautiful relationship. You become also a brother to other Christians and then you also become a member of God's house, God's family. And therefore, uh, that's what St. Paul says very beautifully, that when we become not only children of God, we are also heirs of heaven. So you see how is that relationship just changes and my connections with all, there is a whole network of uh, holiness that is brought to my life so that I little by little can become more and more uh, a child of God. But you see, these, these relations are there and always the theology have, have tried very hard to work at them. And we talk a lot about God fatherhood, the our father. We talk a lot about Jesus Christ. We have the gospels that constantly remind us how he have come to the world and the church mm, repeats again and again. Jesus Christ was identical, the same like any of us, except through sin. Well, that's a very interesting uh, way of looking at it. But it's something to be explored here is that there is a third relationship, very, very important, that is the spousal relationship. And we have it always related it to, the Holy, to the Holy Ghost, to the, whole, to the Holy Spirit. Because, because you see, uh, in that relationship, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it is true that it's the love of the Father and the Son but also for us is very important because we can understand this idea that it comes up in the theology of the body again and again, time and again, and is that God wants to marry us. That's a way of talking, meaning God wants to divinize us. God wants that we become like Him. God wants that uh, we are more and more like Him because He doesn't take His holiness or His goodness or His uh, power to say, no, this is for me and I don't want you people to have it. No, God wants to share it because of His love. And I, and I find it very, very, very enlightening to think about these three relations that, humanly speaking, we have a, a way of living them here on earth that when we do it correctly, when we do it according to God's plans, immediately is an image that, that brings us up to God and actually it, it, it makes us uh, sharers of uh, uh, God's uh, life or the life of the Trinity. Very, very, very interesting. Well, we continue and say uh, what, what, it, what it, the Holy Father says here. Fathers are not, are not born, but they are but made. A man does not become a father simply bringing a child into the world. It's not something so material that you have bring the child and that's it. Nevertheless, I heard a conversation between a father and a son and I say, you remember, this told the father the son, you remember that I am your father and I am before you. And the child told him, Dad, but you were not a father until I was born and I was your son. I made you a father. And actually, that's a, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. But continue with that. A man does not become a father simply because bringing up a child into the world, but by taking up, very interesting this idea, by taking up the responsibility to care for the child whenever a man accepts responsibility for the life of another, in some way he becomes a father to that person. That's why we also talk about spiritual fatherhood. And I have to talk about this because it's something that I experience uh, continually. I mean, is 
I, 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 I cont continually realize that the church, uh, through the sacraments, reminds me that I have that responsibility of the children of God. And that responsibility, as I say here, I will add like a small little thing, and is that a father, really what he does is to provide for his family and to protect his family. That's really the essence of what fatherhood is. And it's not that the mother cannot do that, because many times mothers do that too. But mothers, we talk about them and we say that they are homemakers. Does it mean that a father cannot be a homemaker? No, but we, 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 we in our relationship in, in where man and woman uh, complement each other, that is that they are, they are not competing, but complementing each other. That, it mean, that means that they put together their strengths and uh, together they are able to do much more than each one of them on their own. And that's the beauty of God created them male and female, because he did it for a purpose. Well, he continues here, and it's very interesting because he says the following. He says, Whenever a man accepts responsibility for the life of another, in some way he becomes a father to that person. And very often this fatherhood is expressed, like for example, from a teacher to his pupil, to his student, from a master to his disciples. And and that's, that's what happened. That image of fatherhood is not something lineal of saying how to do something with generating new children of the flesh, but it also generates children of the spirit. And continue saying here something very, very enriching. Children today often seem orphans, lacking fathers. One of the big um, problems that we have in the world is, uh, we said it in an expression that we say in Spanish that is a uh, quite uh, something that I hope they can be translated and understood. Say, in, uh, before, children, uh, parents will have many children. Today, we have children that have many parents. Why? Because the parents separate through divorce and then each one of them uh, takes an, a husband or a wife and then you have now uh, that this child has uh, a father and a mother but he also has uh, 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 the, the husband of uh, his mother and then the wife of his father and then therefore they, they come now uh, very often that there are also another divorce and then uh, this man marries another woman and then and, and, and the, the whole thing multiplies and the child gets completely confused. The child leaves uh, being tossed from one home to the other uh, by weekends. And at the beginning I remember an, 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 a, 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 a young girl already in his, his time, in his years of adolescence, and she would say, Father, at the beginning when I was small, because my parents got divorced when I was four, they would fight for me so that I would be with them every weekend. Now, time has passed by and I am already 19, and I know that whatever home I go, I really spoil their weekend, because they had their plans, and then I come, and they appear, and... Uh, I spoil everything, and therefore I feel so, so bad. And this is what happened with the mysteries of God. When we don't leave them well, uh, Satan uses that because we know very well that he doesn't have his own clay, and what he does is spoil, and he twists, and he uh, poison all those wonderful and beautiful relationships, and then we are unable to see God behind those things. Well, he continues here saying these uh, very interesting uh, concerns about uh, fathers, and he says, children too often seem orphans lacking fathers. The church too need fathers, perhaps not only thinking about priests, that we are called fathers by, by the people of God, but also fathers meaning, meaning figures of men that are ready to take the responsibility of taking care of others. That's what St. Joseph does. St. Paul continues here. Remind, he tells us, St. Paul, Paul tells us with the, in the words of the, of the letter to the Corinthians, though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. It's one of the titles that he uses for himself. 
I am your father because I begot you in the spirit. I suffer for you. And I find it very, very, very enlightening. And he keeps on going on a little bit far, farther and say, Every priest or bishop should be able to add with the apostle, I became your father in Christ through the gospel. Paul likewise calls the Galatians my little children, with whom I am again in travail until Christ be formed in you. Base, you see, uh, he, he has taken the responsibility of working hard to see Christ uh, being formed in them. Beautiful. Well, we continue a little bit farther and now it comes here something very interesting because now we are talking about fatherhood and then all of a sudden he appears and it comes to here the whole idea of chastity. Chastity that we know very well is uh, something that is very related with those vocations that we are told to live uh, uh, according to what the theology of the body rem reminds us. Mm celibacy and uh, matrimony. Well, well, look at what the Holy Father says, talking about St. Joseph. Being a father entails introducing children to life and reality, not holding them back, being overprotective or possessive, but rather making them capable of deciding for themselves. That idea, beauty, so beautiful idea that is, I am a father, I had to protect the child, but also I had to help the child so that it keeps on growing and it, it, it becomes little by little more independent until he is completely independent. It's like to fly a kite. You are holding the string, but a moment comes in this flight in which I have to release the hand and to leave that kite fly on its own. Or like nature, with how many nests where you have the birds that the parents look after the, 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 the little chicks until the moment comes for them to fly for the first time. Sometimes usually it's a clumsy flight and they fall and the parents are there to, 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 to protect them. But then a time comes when they have to fly on their own. Well. Uh, he says something beautiful here. Perhaps for this reason, perhaps for this reason, Joseph is traditionally called most chaste. You go for a benediction in a Catholic church, there are some um, uh, little prayers that you say, that they are the prayers that where we ask for, uh, we try to make up for all the offenses to, to our Lord, to our Lady. And one of them is Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse, talking about our, about our Lady. He says, perhaps, perhaps that's why he's called a most chaste father. That title is not simply a sign of affection, but the summation of the summary of an attitude that is the opposite of possessiveness. Here the Holy Father, Pope Francis, has touched the very essence of really being chaste, of living our love for another person in this case of, of uh, in the, with, with a love that does not possess. Why? Because that's these two attitudes that constantly keep on coming in the theology of the body. I, I have to be receptive. I have to hope and expect that God will give me, give me his gifts. But sometimes, very often, well, our human attitude is to grab those things and say, I want to take these things. And then he says here that chastity is, a, is the summation of an attitude that is opposite to possessiveness. It keeps, on, it keeps on saying, chastity is freedom from possessiveness in every sphere of one's life. Not only, not only in our sexual uh, life, but also in everything. I have to be chaste, that means I cannot possess people. I cannot possess gifts that God gives me. I have to be able to be, in, in, in this sense, in a feminine attitude of saying, I wait. It's like uh, very often this image that is so strong, the man is the one that places the seed, the woman is the one that takes the seed, nurtures it, makes it grow, and gives it life. 
That's the attitude that God wants that we take with him. Not because we are passive, but we are because we are not possessive. That is different. And he keeps on going on and he says, only when love is chased, it is truly love. A possessive love ultimately becomes dangerous. It imprisons, constricts, and makes for misery. And very often, that's a sign of lust. When we want to possess, when we want to grab, when we want to say, that's mine. And continues, a possessive, God himself loved humanity with a chaste love. He left us free even to go astray and set ourselves against him. It's amazing. God could say and say, I, am the I have the power, I am almighty, you will never be able to do anything that goes against my will. No, because he doesn't, he, he creates us with freedom and he respects our freedom and he takes the risk that we may go against him. This is really uh, amazing, surprising. God, why, why do you do that? And he continues saying, the logic of love is always the logic of freedom. And Joseph knew how to love with extraordinary freedom. He never made himself the center of things. He did not think of himself, but focused instead on the lives of Mary and Jesus. Wow, what a very beautiful attitude for us Christians. Who well, not only that, you don't know, you realize and for women that sometimes complain a little bit that men don't talk too much. And Joseph is a, is a character in the Gospels that never, ever said anything. It's a silent character. But what he does and how he behaves speak volumes. We can make him a, mo a model for us. Because of this love. Because of this freedom. And you remember that one of the four characteristics of the love to be like the love of God is to be free. First of all, it has to be free. Then it has to be total. Then it has to be uh, faithful. And it has to be fruitful. I could develop this four, uh, this four characteristic of God's love, but it's not, the, it's not the moment to do so. But you see how it appears here. And chastity, what it does is to help us to live that uh, freedom of love and therefore avoid any possessiveness. He continues a little bit farther, and we are getting now getting uh, to our end, the end of our meditation. Being a father in, entails introducing children to life and reality, not holding them back, being upper pr protective. Jesus, Joseph, found happiness not in mere self-sacrificing or self-gift, in him, we never see frustration, but only trust. His patient silence was the prelude to concrete expressions of trust. He trusted God. He trusted those dreams, four dreams. <coughs> Our world today needs fathers. It has... It has not, sorry, it has no use for tyrants who would domineer others and as means of compensating to their own needs. But did you see, that's another idea that it comes very often in theology of the, of the body. It's totally foreign, says the same, same Paul, saying John Paul II, totally foreign to the Christian idea to have a God that is a tyrant. And people many times have been beguiled, beguiled and, 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 and they have been cheated and they think that God is a tyrant, that yes, I want you to do my will. No, God's will is in order to make us happy here on earth and to be with him forever and ever in the kingdom of heaven. Because that is his home, his family home that he wants to share with us. He continued, the Holy Father saying, 
when fathers do make sure the sacrifice, this, that's why it, it, it rejects those who confuse authority with authoritarianism. That is, one of the things is to, to use to have authority, and God does have authority, but he's not uh, an author, author, author Ritanism. That means that he's not an authoritarian in the sense of saying, my will, it has to be done because it's mine and because I want you to do it. No, he's, done, he's doing it for our, for, for, our, for our good. And then he says, God, they confuse, they confuse that and they don't understand that God's authority is for service, with servility. They, 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 they confuse service with being servile. That means to behave like a slave. No, service is because of love. I continue saying discussion with oppression. Charity with a welfare mentality. Power with distraction. These days we are seeing it. The power is not for dis distracting the others. Like now, for example, it may happen with, the, with the Russia and Ukraine. Because they have power, they do that. No, 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 no. Power has to be done, have to be used in order to serve the others, to bring good. And the time is over. I would like to end like saying this, this, uh, this idea that the Holy Father finishes this, this, uh, this point. I have not finished it completely. There are two more paragraphs, but I will leave it here. He says, every true vocation is born on the gift of oneself which is the fruit of mature sacrifice. The priesthood and consecrated life likewise requires this kind of maturity. And I will add marriage too, of course, this maturity of sacrifice. Whatever our vocation, whether to marriage, celibacy or virginity, our gift of self will not come to fulfillment if it stops at sacrifice, where, where that the case, instead of becoming a sign of the beauty and joy of love, the gift of self would risk being an expression of unhappiness, sadness and frustration. I'm going to leave it here and we can see that Joseph is a real example for us and he unfolds so many wonderful uh, seeds that the theology of the body has that we can later on apply to our, own, our, our lives. The idea that we all can be a fathers when we take clear responsibility on the other people. And that can be done by, by men and women. And then also that idea of avoiding possessiveness. That is, in love, we cannot possess the other person. We have to respect that freedom of love. And we have to be able to have that attitude of somebody who is in the posture of receiving and accepting the gifts of God. Saint Joseph is a real model for all of us. Let us ask our Lady Mary, thank you for having that wonderful husband that is such an example for us, not only for those who are married, also for those who give their life to God in celibacy through the priesthood or through virginity in the religious life. God bless you. And I want to make a small little prayer, praying with all of you. Hail guardian of the Redeemer, espouse of the Blessed Virgin Mary. To you God entrusted his only Son, in you Mary placed her trust, with you Christ became man. Blessed Joseph, to us to show yourself a father and guide us in the path of life, obtain for us grace, mercy and courage and defend us from every evil. Amen. God bless you.